for our time of worship today. Good morning and welcome to Pathway. Welcome to those joining us online as well. And if you are new with us, we're so happy that you're here. We're going to start our time of worship every weekend. We want to continue to make this place the most welcoming place you visit all week. So help us do that. We want to invite you to stand. Find someone around you, maybe someone you haven't met. Introduce yourselves and get ready to worship. Second Samuel chapter 2 verse 2 it says no one is holy like the Lord there's no one besides you there's no rock like our God so let's be reminded of who he is as we sing these words together lift your voice with us who was there before there was creation who illuminates the stars and sun Set eternity in motion Oh, there is just the one That's our God Who can calm the storm With just a whisper Who can make the darkest demons run Who can break the curse of generations Oh, there just the one, oh, it's Jesus. Sing out, lift your voice. The mighty line of Judah, the pure and spotless lamb, the Alpha and Omega, the good and great I am, the God that saves the nations, the one we bow before. So let every voice sing out, who is life, who is Thank you, Jesus. Who was laid to rest like every 
weekend at Pathway, we do a highlight of one of our ministries. And this morning, when we all walked into this building, you were welcomed by one of our ushers. And they were here before you all showed up to set a table for each one of us to be welcomed into this place and feel a part of this family. So this morning, we get to hear from one of our ushers, Sheila, and her heart for this ministry. So let's watch this video together. I'm Sheila Spies, and I work as an usher. I do Saturday evening services. You want to do something, and this was a, a way to, a segue to get into that and do something. And you're working with other people together as a group, and it's it's really nice community, too. And it's a way to make friends and have relationships with more people and deeper relationships, because you're working side by side. Wanting to be a part, you know, just wanting to participate, be a part of what Pathic is doing to reach people for Jesus. People who walk in that door, and don't know what to expect, and are very nervous and anxious that they're comfortable. You know, just that they're welcome, they belong here. Would you like a coffee? That's how we serve. Just feeling a sense of purpose that, you know, you were able to make somebody feel comfortable. And as you do it, you become more and more comfortable approaching people and, and being more outgoing. Even things that you might think are very small because you may not have a great talent he can use and he lets you know he is using you and that's all you care about then you're, you're so blessed that he was able to use you even in a small way just by being friendly just being helpful or trying to be helpful there are things you can do that don't, they do not take a lot of time if you're uncomfortable approaching people you're perfect because nobody understands people's anxiety like someone else who has trouble approaching people so imagine you can imagine walking into a room that you don't know anyone so you've got the heart you can have a heart for these people and everyone's walked into a room and felt that everybody's gone into a room where they haven't felt a part anyone who um, would invite someone into their home can do this if you have a full schedule this is perfect because it's a half an hour early for the service there's no prep you don't have to do anything ahead of time you just show up meeting pray and serve he made us to serve and to serve others and he will use you Amen. Can we thank Sheila for sharing her heart with us? I love, I love what she said. He made us to serve and he made us to serve others. And it reminded me of scripture from Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we're all called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and have him form us and fill us more and more. And this morning, we're going to introduce a new song and this song will be sung throughout this new series that we're starting this weekend. And we just hope that these words that we're going to sing will become a simple prayer for the Lord to make us more as Himself as we're being changed into His image. So I want to ask you to stand as we continue to worship. Yeah. 
your feet My desires and dreams I lay Your healing 
What's broken, rebuilding the ruins we wait for you. that you paid on our behalf. Lord, you established a covenant with us long ago. The covenant means that we can't complete it. You've had to do it on our behalf and you haven't abandoned us even when we deserve it. There's nothing that we can do that's going to accomplish being with you to satisfy the covenant that you've established. So Lord, you brought Jesus, you established that for us. You, he paid the price for that. And we don't have to do anything except accept it. And that's amazing, Lord. But you call us to do more than that. You call us to empty ourselves and fill ourselves with you, to be a reflection to the rest of the world that this is what you've done for us so that others may see that. And Lord, there's so much power in that when we see what you're doing in our lives and others have a chance to see that. And so we ask, Lord, that that be the state of our heart is that when people see us, all they see is you. And that's our prayer. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. You can have a seat. 
Hey, good morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Tanner. I'm one of the youth pastors here on staff, and I just want to let you know that we are so thankful that you would come and worship with us this morning. And here in a moment, we're going to continue on in our worship through our giving, as we do every week. And when I think of giving, um, I'm just reminded of all the things that Jesus has continuously given me. As I sit and I hear your voices, it is a choir of people who have experienced the good news of Jesus, of those who have been blessed by Jesus, who have received something from Jesus. And whether that be our time, our treasure, our talent, our finances, when we give back with our hearts set on Christ, it is our true and proper worship. It is saying, Jesus, everything that I have, I want it to be yours. I just want to honor you with my life. And when we give is a way of saying, actually, my finances is not Lord of my life. Jesus, you are, because you are still in control. You are still sovereign, and you have blessed us. I want to give it back in worship to you. I think of Colossians 3.1 that says, therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We have been raised, so let us raise our hearts to him and set our hearts on things above where he is seated. I believe by doing this, we will encounter the living God. I believe that Jesus is ready to do a work right here. And as we think this morning of how else can we as a church set our hearts where Christ is seated, we have an awesome opportunity coming up here starting this Monday, and you know what it is, but it's 21 days of prayer where we as a church are gathering and committing to saying, I want to be a church and a people who says, I want to pray. I want to pray in unison. I want to pray for unity as a body of believers, all lifting our voices and our hearts up to Jesus at once. And there is so much happening in our world today. We are in an election season, if you didn't know that. There are natural disasters happening. There are things, there's people hurting, and we want to be a church that says, hey, we don't just want to sit back and do nothing, but rather give ourselves in love and prayer. How awesome would it be if we have a church for just 21 days said, let us pray without ceasing, what would God do? I believe that we would see an extraordinary move of God if we set our hearts in prayer. And daily devotionals will actually be sent out if you want to sign up for that. There's a QR code in your bulletin that you can sign up and commit to 21 days of prayer where the people of Pathway are writing devotionals and sending them out all as one as a church. And it is going to be a special opportunity to do such a thing. And we are so excited about that. And so whatever it is, whether it be our finances, our thoughts, our minds, our voices, our time, our treasure, our prayers, let us be a church that sets our heart on the one true God. And then God will do an amazing work and we will be a small part of it. I am so excited for what God is going to do. And so especially this morning. So for those, I want to invite those who are serving us this morning to come forward and to pass the buckets. But before we do that, we have an awesome opportunity. Something unique is happening. We have 250 middle school students, leaders, high school students who are also volunteering to work the kitchen and cut up broccoli for real. I mean, they're making food out in Michigan several hours away at a fall retreat. And this is the biggest middle school retreat that Pathway has ever had. And God is on the move. He is changing hearts. And we want to be a church that says we want to pray for 250 people who are encountering Jesus for the first time and for those who who know Jesus and are growing. And so we're going to pray over the offering, and we want to celebrate what God is doing this morning up in Michigan, here locally, and then around our world. So let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Lord, I pray that as we give our, our, our time, our talent, our treasure in worship and an offering, Lord, that you would bless that. I pray that you would take this offering to wherever it may be needed. Lord, that you are in control of it, that you put it where you see fit, and that we would have hearts that are set on you. Jesus, I pray for those up in Michigan who are encountering you and who might be tired, who might be discouraged. Lord, that you would encourage them, that you would continue to build them up, strengthen them. And Lord, that hearts would not just be inspired, but hearts would be changed for the good news of the gospel. Lord, that they would encounter you and that there would be unity at that retreat and in this church and around the world this morning. So Father, we love you and we praise you and ask all these things in your name. Amen. 
hey, right now is a great time to pull out your sermon notes, your Bible, as we are starting a new series called Irresistible Influence. Let's check this out. everybody. Hey, uh, take your Bibles if you have them this morning and turn to John chapter 15. That's where we're going to land here in just a few moments. And, uh, you know, 250 junior hires, that's a lot of junior hires to be in one space. Uh, I'm glad they're there and I'm here. So, uh, yeah, I've done junior hires before. Uh, but when you think about junior high ministry and all that's going on within our student ministry, think as well about Kids City. And uh, we're walking in this series about really how, what does it mean to, to have an influence on those around us? Um, Sociologists tell us about uh, the average person influences about 10,000 people through the course of their lifetime. And so you do that in ways that you don't realize you're doing that just by who you are and, you know, how you interact and, you know, how you walk into spaces and what you do with spaces, your relationships and all that goes with that. Can you imagine what would happen if we'd get really intentional about it? And, uh, and certainly one area is in the ministry around here is influencing kids as it relates to their faith in Jesus. A few weeks ago, I think there were about 65 kids who made a decision to follow Christ at kid, in Kid City a couple Sundays ago. And I think that's worth applauding as well this morning. Really, really awesome. And uh, we record those. We make sure that there's some good follow-up that goes on with that as well. But just a great opportunity for you to connect in ministry in some way. Maybe you're not. Um, my daughter, my 15-year-old, a couple Sundays ago, uh, she came out of the house. She had her Kid City shirt on. Uh, we're driving here, and she said, today, she said, today's my first day being a leader. And, uh, and so she was a leader, you know, in her classroom. And today, she's up at the junior high retreat cutting broccoli. And I uh, wish she would cut broccoli at the house, but she's cutting broccoli for junior hires. But uh, just a great opportunity to be an influence in that. You know, uh, Tanner expressed the fact that we're in this interesting season, aren't we? And we've got hurricanes and storms. Uh, we've got wars that are going on that that we have no idea where all this is going to, to, to end up, and we've got this thing called a, an election. And with that brings all sorts of challenges our way, and, and, uh, and man, you know, in the midst of that, it feels turbulent, and it feels difficult, and maybe with the, even within some of your relationships, it feels that way. I hope that it doesn't, but it can feel that way. And so what we wanted to do in this series was uh, really just kind of help us as a body to walk through this season with some intentionality, and particularly as it relates to how you care for yourself, how you carry yourself, how you live out your identity to those around you that you have in Christ Jesus, and, and how you influence those around you as well. And really it begins with understanding what it means to, to really anchor yourself in the truth of God's word. Uh, this idea of an anchor is something that we see throughout Scripture, and the truth is that when we're in a, a season like we're in, you really do need something to anchor you. And, and, uh, and Jesus even, even, even was very clear in telling his disciples that uh, in this life, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have trouble. And you're going to need something to, to hold you and to hold you fast. And, and, uh, and so this morning, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about really four truths that Jesus gives to us and in this John 15 passage that really, in many ways, are an anchor that can hold us uh, in these unsteady times, more or less. And uh, so I want to give you a big idea this morning. Here it is. It's just simply this, and that, that is what you are attached to, what you are attached to will determine what you produce out of your life. In other words, what you are attached to internally uh, will determine the way that you influence externally, where you live and where you learn and where you work and where you play. So in John chapter 15, this is all part of what we would call the upper room discourse. Uh, Jesus has gathered with his disciples. He's washed their feet. Uh, he's done communion, first communion with them. They had no idea what that all meant at that moment, but, but he did it with them. Uh, Judas has, has kind of made his deal and he's made his way out the door. And then beginning in John chapter 13, all the way through 17, 
Jesus is giving to his disciples some final words before he, before he goes to the cross. I don't know about you, but if you knew you had just a couple days to live and you knew that that death was going to be excruciating and you knew that what it was going to be about, what it was going to be for, I mean, what would you be saying to those closest to you? And Jesus, Jesus really uses this time to kind of anchor his disciples in some truth. And so we're going to see that in John chapter 15, really kind of four anchors to hold you. And the first is this, and that is that, that you really have to anchor yourself in the truth of, of really who Jesus is to you. Uh, Jesus begins by saying this, verse, verse 1 of 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. And understand if I am the vine, he's, he's actually worked his way through a dialogue with his disciples over a period of time about the I am's and who I really am. And, and uh, so he ends with this, with this phrase, with this picture in their minds that I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, the vine was really important, and I think it's really, 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 really critical that we understand that, especially in light of the fact Jesus is about ready to go to the cross, what he's really declaring about himself, that I am the vine, that, that God planted Israel in the promised land to be a means of revealing himself to the world. He said, you are going to be a kingdom of priests, and you're going to be a holy nation, and you're going to draw people to me. Uh, they were to be the vine that would bear great fruit. And, uh, and so the vineyard became a symbol for the nation of Israel. Uh, between uh, that 400 period of silence uh, before Jesus shows up in the scene, um, there, was a, there was a coin of the Maccabees that actually had a, has a, was a vine, had a vine on it. And uh, on the temple, when the temple was built in Jerusalem, there was a gold grapevine on the gates of the temple, you would always see that grapevine there, reminding the people of Israel that you are the vine, that you are the vine. But yet the nation did not live up to producing the fruit that delighted the Lord. Uh, several verses for this in, in the Old Testament, let me just give you a couple. Isaiah 5, 7 said, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. You didn't do anything. He said, look what you did. He said, verse Jer Jeremiah 2, 21, but I was the one who planted you, choosing a vine of the purest stock, the very best. How did you grow into this corrupt, wild vine? And so in these final hours, uh, Jesus declared that Israel is not the vine. You've been thinking you're the vine, but you're not the vine. I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine, and you are the branches that will produce much fruit. And so the image, the understanding we get in this is that actually the vine is the one who carries the source of life to the branches that bear the fruit. And so when you answer the question, the truth of who is Jesus to you? Well, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we realize that the truth of who Jesus is to us is that our life is found in Christ. John 10.10, 10, that, that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give you life to a full. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. He is the source of our life, the source of our life here on this earth and the source of life for, for all of eternity. And so the second truth that you need to hang on to then is this, and that is the truth of what our Father then does for us. Jesus talks about himself. I'm the vine. And then he talks about the father and the role of the father in the midst of, 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 of those of us who are part of this vine growing, growing fruit. There's a, there's a great vine, a great vine uh, called the Great Vine of Hampton Court. It's found in London. It's, uh, it's over 230 years old, and it's uh, about five feet wide, over 120 feet long. And it's one vine with many branches. And so when you think about that vine with one vine with many branches, uh, over 230 some years old, the truth is that the vine, that vine needed a gardener and what we would call a vine dresser. That vine dresser would come along and it cares for that vine, has, has had many, many, many vine dressers over those 230 some years. Now just think about that as it relates to you being the vine and what is the father's role within your life and within all of our lives. Jesus declares it this way, verses one through three again, that I am the vine and my father is the gardener. And then it says he cuts off. If you have your Bibles open, for those of you that 
bring your Bible with you and, and uh, you have it open, maybe your version, whatever, you can highlight there. That little phrase, he cuts off, is a great phrase to underline. He said, he cuts off every branch in me that bears fruit, no fruit, <clears throat> while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, another great little phrase to underline, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean, another word to underline, because the word that I have spoken to you. So I am the vine, and my father's gardener, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean, because the word that I have spoken to you. And so he talks about the father, and he says he cuts off, he prunes, and he cleans. Some of us have grown up with this understanding of he cuts off as being that we see the father reaching in and cutting off. I'm going to cut that one out. I'm going to cut that one out. And I'm going to cut that one out. But, but there's really two ways to look at this. And, and one is to look at it that way, that the father goes in and he just kind of begins to cut out branches. And, you know, if you're not bearing, I'm getting you out of here and I'm getting you out of here and I'm getting you out of here. And yet there are seasons in our lives as Christ followers when we don't bear there are seasons in our lives that actually we find ourselves uh, maybe tired and maybe weary and, and really struggling uh, with some season of our life. And so there's another way in which we can interpret this little phrase, he cuts off, and it would be this way, that he lifts up. That when a gardener, when a vine dresser goes into the vineyard, many times a vine dresser will carry strings with them into the vineyard, and, and uh, they'll walk in, and when they see that there's a vine that is hanging down onto the ground, they won't cut it off. They'll tie it up to keep it away from the pests on the ground, but actually to bring it up so it can get the nutrients it needs from the sun and whatever else, so that in turn it can kind of regain its source of life, and once again it will, it will produce that fruit. Now, we actually see this uh, throughout in scripture, there's a moment, and in, in, I think the best place is in Psalm 3. In Psalm 3, David, uh, David is, is uh, on the run uh, from his son Absalom, who's revolted against David. And, uh, and David is tired and he's weary, and his head is hanging low. And, uh, and this is what the text says, Lord, how many of my foes, how many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, you are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts my head high. You are the lifter of my head. I think we see a beautiful picture of this in, with the prodigal son when the son is walking down that road and the father is standing at the end of the road and, and he's waiting for this son. And the son, obviously, you know, in the picture of what we have with this prodigal, uh, with, this, with this parable that Jesus shares is, is of this son who is, who's been humbled, who's been broken, who is walking down and thinking to himself, I am willing to be a servant, to sleep out on the front porch of my father's house, than to be where I'm at. I've lost my senses. I've come to my senses. And we have this image of the son walking down the road with his head hanging low. And then we get the image of the father running out, running out just in a full bore run towards his son, grabbing his son, and in that moment, kissing him all over and in many ways, lifting his head up high. He lifts us up. He prunes, and, and he prunes to bring about more fruit in your life and in my life. He cuts back. Kent Hughes talks about this reality of that, that, that here you have the creator God in, in John chapter 15. I love so much is that Jesus, as the creator, understands vineyards, <laughs> understands the vine, and, uh, and here you have this picture of, of our creator getting in and tending to the vineyard and lifting it up and pruning it back and and, and that pruning sometimes can feel painful and can, find, can sometimes feel very difficult. And, uh, and yet at the same time, as Kent Hughes says so well, he says, God's hand is never closer than when he prunes the vine. During those times, the severest cutting, when to us he may seem to have departed, he is the closest. His pruning may pain us, but it will never harm us. Hmm. And he cleans. 
It says he, he cleans out he cleans out the old. He cleans out the old. You know, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5, that, that uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. Cleans out the old. Um, and, and, and the truth is that there are those moments, though, within our life in this cleaning of cleaning. You go in and you, you clean out the old dead branches. I was doing that with a tree last week. I, I was uh, cleaning out the old dead branches of this tree, just getting the dead ones out so the rest of the tree could begin to flourish. That's what you do, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's what you do. And uh, I was doing it. Don't know if I was doing it at the right time of the year, but I was doing it. So the tree should be standing next year. We'll find out. But anyway, uh, cleaning out those dead branches so that the others can grow into that tree and, and yet sometimes we feel as if maybe there's some things in us that need to be cleaned out. I don't know if you've ever heard someone say, I feel like I'm dying on the vine. And what causes a branch to die on the vine? Well, outwardly there may be neglect from the vine dresser, uh, or winter sets in, or pests, harsh weather, difficult times. Internally, Something has taken place in the branch that has cut off the line source from keeping it alive. And the best way to clear old wood from our lives is the truth of God's word in our life. <clears throat> it's to be in his word. Uh, for 15.3 says, again, you are already clean because the word that I have spoken to you. You know, I've given you new life. And, and when we live by the word of God, I, I, I just thought about this a number of weeks ago when I was processing, just kind of laying out the thoughts on, on this message. And, and, uh, and the fact is that when we live by the word of God, our soul is fed, our convictions are shaped, our conversations are guided. In the season we're in right now, we need our conversations guided. Faithfulness to God's word produces fruitfulness within our life and, and in and through our life. And that you need God's word. You need God's word to still you and to lead you and to equip you and to transform you and to heal you and to lift your head up. Uh, Thursday, Aaron and I uh, drove down to Allen County Jail uh, to visit someone who's in jail. And, uh, and so we got in and uh, it was just a very easy process. So thankful for uh, the process that they have in place there to, to allow clergy to get in very easily. And so we got in and I, I told him, I said, I don't even know if I know who this guy is. And so we're waiting, you know, glass between us and, and in he walks. And as soon as he, as soon as he came into the door, I, went, I know you. And he sat down and, and we just began to have a conversation. And what was interesting is that I talked to his mom uh, on Friday, and she said, you know, he had even said to us, he said, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really disappointed with Pathway, that, you know, they've not come in to see me, and, and, uh, and yet we were trying. We, he was in another facility. We had been trying and trying and trying, and just very difficult. And so here we were on that day, sitting with him, and, and just spending a great deal of time just talking and listening and, uh, and him encouraging us as much as we were encouraging him, he said, you know, he said, I, I made a decision that with my, with my cellmate every day, he said, I, he said, I don't care who it is, I make him read a Proverbs with me every day. In the morning and at night. And he said, that does so much. You know, there's 2.3 million incarcerated people in our country. That's huge. And, uh, and we, we actually are beginning to talk about ways in which we can engage uh, more, um, more diligently with that because there's opportunity to share the gospel. There's opportunity to give great encouragement along the way. And we left encouraged. Paul Tripp says it well. He said, what controls your meditation will control your thoughts about God, yourself, others, your situation, and even nature itself. And as you meditate on what you are suffering, your joy wanes. Your hope fades, and God seems increasingly distant. But when you meditate on God's word, perspective comes into play. Just a few minutes a day. The third is this. I'm going to move here. Let's go quickly. The truth is, of what Jesus desires from you, and I would also encourage you to write down below that line of from, from, for you as well. Verses 4 through 12 
Again, if you have your Bibles open, there's some key words in here that I want you to consider online, just really one, and that's the word remain. It appears about 11 times in these few short verses. He said, remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown in the fire and burned. But he said, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. He said, in other words, if you remain in me, you're not going to be dying off the vine. You may have seasons where you need your head lifted, but you're going to be dying off the vine. And if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. It sounds like, I can just ask Jesus for anything, it's going to be done for me. But actually, as, as you get closer to the heart of Jesus, your prayers begin to, to, to bring Jesus into it. And you begin to say, you begin to, are you able to pray that prayer, God, not my will, but your will be done in the midst of this situation. And, and suddenly, your prayers do begin to change along the way. He goes on. He said, this is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep your commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my commands and remain in his love. Love is another word to underline. He said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, to love each other as I have loved you. So what does Jesus desire from us and for us, very quickly, the first is this, fruit. <laughs> he wants us all to bear fruit. And what is fruit? Well, I came across a great definition this week. It's great. He said, fruit is a visible display of the character of Christ through an abiding relationship with him for the benefit of others and the glory of God. Not for you, but for others and the glory of God. And how is that fruit produced within our life? It's produced within our life through relationship, an intimate relationship with Jesus, through growing in our intimacy with Christ, that intimacy is what Jesus desires from you and for you. Paul talks about this in Ephesians, in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, when he talks to the church of Philippi, and he says, this is my one, one, one my big prayer for you. And he said, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. There's the fruit that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He said, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. And knowledge is not head knowledge. We want to have a, want to have a faith in God that certainly is based upon a knowledge that we believe in and that we understand and, and that keeps us centered when our emotions are all over the place. But what he's talking about here is he's talking about a deep, intimate knowledge, a growing knowledge. It's, it's this understanding of what it means to, to be in this intimate relationship, getting up close and personal, and allowing the heart of God to begin to shape your heart. And, and, uh, and that's so critically important that we do that. It's like a, a married couple. You get married... When you get married, they, you know, you're declared as one. But the truth is that oneness doesn't happen in that moment. <laughs> that oneness happens over a lifetime. You grow in a sense of oneness. And, uh, and, and when that oneness is kind of torn apart, you long for that oneness once again. You long for that one because of that growth of intimacy in Christ. A few weeks ago, I, I, I did the funeral for Jerry Parrish and um, it was a, a few years ago that actually I, I, did, I did the funeral for his wife, Nancy. And, uh, and I remember when, when Nancy, when she, when she died, or when she was dying, um, Jerry, they'd been married 60 years at the time. Uh, Jerry just stood up and he began to recite a poem that he wrote about his wife. And uh, it didn't make any babies cry. Actually, it actually created, it was a pretty incredible moment. And, so we were all in the room when, uh, when Nancy was, uh, was dying, and he gets up, and, and he doesn't read it. He just says it. I've had a good life because I had a good wife. If I should die today, I couldn't complain because I had a good life because I had a good wife. We always had food on the table, maybe only hot dogs and tomato soup in the beginning, but we made do and got by just fine. I've had a good life because I had a good wife. 
He said, we always had a roof over our heads, maybe a 20 by 30 house with a leaky basement and without food, without a front door, but we worked together, fixed it up and made it into a nice little home. I've had a good life because I had a, a good wife. We raised three boys without much trouble. They all turned out fine, and I'm proud of each one of them. And I give her more credit than me. I've had a good life because I had a good wife. Now that we're in our so-called golden years, we were looking out for each other as it should be, but it seemed like she did more looking out for me than I did for her. I've had a good life because I had a good wife. So if I haven't said it before, I'll say it, I'll say it now. I've had a good life because I had a good wife. Thank you, Nancy. Love you forever. He recited that at her funeral home, at her funeral. And I waited to recite that till the final moment uh, of, uh, of our graveside. How many men in this room have written a poem to your wife? You got some work to do, guys. <laughs> you got some work to do. So do I. Trust me. I think I need a poem. Uh, we do. But there's, there's an element of that deep sense of intimacy growing over a lifetime. And out of that comes our character. Our character. You know, human fruitfulness, one writer said it well, is manifest in the kind of people we are becoming because our inward character transformation profoundly influences the fruitfulness that we produce outwardly. What happens inwardly is produced outwardly. And that fruitfulness is found within the, within the confines. I mean, Jesus makes it very clear to us in Galatians that it's all about love and joy and peace and and, uh, and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It's all one fruit, all bound together that what he's trying to work in all of us. So how is that fruit produced and that character shaped? Well, he makes it clear three ways, very quickly. One is abiding, one is waiting, one is suffering. That word abiding, interesting word, it, 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 it's not talking about a union, it's talking about communion. That when you say yes to Jesus, you are in union with Christ, but the communion is up to you. You have to cultivate the communion. It's found in the waiting, and none of us wait. Wanna, none of us want to wait, but yet we know that that character is developed over the course of a lifetime. That, that Isaiah 40, 31 talks about the fact that, that those who wait in the Lord that he will renew their strength. It reminds us of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 when he had that thorn in his flesh and he cries, he's crying out to Christ, remove this from me, remove this from me, remove this from me. And Jesus says, no, for my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then Paul would go on to write, therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I often wonder, how long did it take for Paul to pen that verse between the verse where Jesus said, uh, my grace sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. How long did it take him to realize that it, it, it's true? It's true. There's the promise, and then there's a fulfillment of the promise, and there's the waiting in between, which many times involves suffering. Romans 5 James 1. And, and in that suffering, you develop a new sense of, of conviction. And, and that intimacy that you have with Jesus, that, that conviction, that conviction, it, it comes through the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God into your life. And one of the things the Spirit of God wants to convict all of us of is the fact that then not only do we come to this place of recognizing the fruit that we want to bear, that he wants to bear in our lives, the intimacy, the character being shaped, the conviction that is beginning to work within your life, is that it leads us then to contribution. Sheila said it well. The Lord made us to serve. That the God of the universe, the one who spoke all things into an existence, into an existence, is, as Philippians 2, we'll see this, we'll unpack this over these next number of weeks, is that he took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And that contribution is lived out through your time and your talent and the treasure that he's given you and your touch, engaging 
with others in the midst of all that. And that is brought forth in your gifts, as, 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 uh, as 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, Romans 12 t- says that we all have these gifts, we're all part of the body of Christ, and so we use those gifts, and he's given you a passion, the ability to, to be connected with something that just draws within you a sense of passion, and, and you want to be a part of that, and you know that, that God has put that in you to do something about it and be a part of it, and, and then it's lived out through your story, which is God's story being lived out through you. The true character transformation brings true neighborly love and it it requires a supernatural source. And that is that when you grow in your intimacy with Christ, you begin to live out the commands that Christ has for you. And he makes the command so simple. My command is this. To love each other as I have loved you. In this season of storms and wars and elections, be an irresistible influence of patience, of kindness. Be smart. Be smart. Think about what you're doing. But be loving in the midst of all of it. He said, verse 12, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. Just obey my command. I've told you that your joy may be in you and your joy may be complete by just living out my command. And what's interesting is he starts out this discourse by giving the command. He said, uh, a new command I give you Love one another as I have loved you so that you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The vine, stay connected. Allow him to produce the fruit in you and through you. I find it interesting that, uh, again, God is so smart uh, that the last thing that Jesus declares is the fact of the vine. And with the vine, we get this image of the grapes and the wine and the fact the first miracle that Jesus displays before those around him is turning that water into the finest of wine. And the last act that he has with his disciples is taking the bread and the wine. This is my body. And this is my blood. And he says, all I want you to do is to practice that and to seek me. I'm going to turn it upstairs. They're going to walk you guys through this moment of communion. But this morning, I I thought for us um, down here, we're going to do something a little different. And um, a few weeks ago, I was just kind of listening to a song one morning in my little time. And uh, a song called, The More I Seek You. And as I listened to that song, I thought, you know, God, allow this to be my prayer because, because I know that in this season and in this time that what I need in my life is I need more of your peace. I need greater perspective. And what this song said to me is the importance of getting close to the one who ultimately gives us the only peace that we're all longing for. And that is the peace that Christ offered to us the work he did for us upon the cross. We're going to take communion after this song. And so if you did not receive the elements when you came in, the uh, folks serving us are going to come down and they're going to have those. Just raise your hand and uh, just allow this song to kind of wash over you this morning. seek you 
John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, um, not as the world gives you. Romans says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, been, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's stand together, shall we? Um, I know these are, uh, for the community, I just kind of make reference to it this morning. Um, these are actually really easy this morning. And so uh, the bottom is the bread, top is the, is the juice. And uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed, uh, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. And then he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant that is being poured out for you, my blood. Do this whenever you drink. Let's drink together. Jesus, thank you for the peace that we have that you've given to each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we get ready to leave this place, that we would leave longing to draw near and near to you and allowing you, Lord, to do a new work in each and every one of our lives. Help us to, as we read your word, to allow it to reveal things in our lives that need to be cut out. Uh, Lord, for some of us, we may be in a season of weariness, and our prayer this morning is, God, just lift up my head. I need you to lift me up today. And may they be encouraged for the fact that, that they don't have a father in heaven that is, is there to cut them, cut them out and throw it aside, but actually is there to tend to the very deepest needs of our soul. We love you. That's in Jesus' name I pray.
Just get ready to leave this morning. I want to say, first of all, to our guests, uh, welcome. Stop by guest services on the way out. If you're looking for next steps, stop by next steps. Let me just give you this as you leave this morning. May the God of hope <clears throat> fill you <clears throat> with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.